Okay, so hi again, everyone. Thanks for um, sticking by and being patient as we sorted things out. Um, today, we have a lovely guest, Doreen Day, with us. If you logged in earlier, you would have um, heard from us that Edna is unable to make it today. So our conversation will be with Doreen, and we're really looking forward to that. So what we're going to do is um, we have a few questions that we're going to start a conversation with and hear from Doreen. Um, the, the session is being recorded, so it'll be available later if you want to check it out again. Um, I think we'll start with, um, we'll just go right into introductions for Doreen because we already spent some time ch chatting with you about what's coming up in the next month or so and what, what to look forward to. So um, I would really like to uh, welcome Doreen and invite you to give your own introduction. So you introduce yourself however you like to. Okay, miigwech. Buju Ninden Wema Ganidug, Wab no Quendition Cas, Wab Jason to Dame Abiting Aikwa Cape Medeo, and the Schnabe Ojiboy Quen Dow, Gaye, on that Dizzy Quen Dow, Mino Amade one Quen Dow, Asa Bikune, Zagai Ginning in Dunjaba, um, Waban in Daya, um, me Gretch for having me, and um. It's going to be a good evening, Miigwech. Awesome. Thank you. It's a, I always like when people introduce themselves. It's a, it's so much different than doing the introductions. But I do want <laughs> to do a little bit of an introduction just to, um, just to let people know that um, you know, Doreen and I have known each other for several years. I don't even know where we met or how. It just sort of one of those things that happened. Doreen is a midwife um, and also a keeper of songs, uh, Medewin Kwe, and a ceremonial person, very knowledgeable. Um, and so we're wanting with this uh, session, Doreen, to really um, focus in on the things that you know um and sometimes like i said at the beginning there is kind of a lack of knowledge or barriers around finding out about menopause particularly so we really want to focus this session in on your perspective which will be from a Nishnabe perspective um on on your knowledge around water around ceremony, around birthing, around uh, trauma, around uh, and people um, and menopause as much as you feel comfortable sharing that. So that's what we were sort of wanting to to cover today. And um, okay. so I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Tanya and we'll start with the first question. Okay. So one of the things that's important uh, to us in doing these discussions is the language. So trying to find out in the different languages, what, how do you say menopause? So we, we started out our first um, discussions with my mom and Maria Campbell, who are Cree speakers. And when Christy and I first started talking about doing these discussions on menopause, we were trying to think about what a name for menopause, what, what the name should be called the series or the discussions, because we didn't want to call it menopause talks or something like that. Menopause is just not a very nice word the way that it sounds. So it, we, I went and asked my mom and we asked Maria and they went on their own little journey to find out, you know, talk to other language speakers because suddenly they started to realize yeah, well, what do we call it? And, and why do we call it that? And, you know, that's so weird that we would call it that. And all these little discussions that were coming up and a lot of visiting around trying to find out how do we say menopause in Cree. So we they, we came to the notokweo bongi gewin as the, the word for menopause in the name of our discussions. And so in Cree, that translates loosely to the old lady stops visiting you. 
So that was how menopause is sometimes often referred to in Cree. So that's just a little bit of a background of the name and the importance mm -hmm. of language to us in this around talking about this and kind of leading into our first question, which is, um, what is the Anishinaabe word for menopause or for this change in a person's life? And do you have a rough translation of it? Or do you have um, a, a sense of what the word means to you? Well, it's a good question because I've, I've never been asked it before. For one thing, I'm a language learner myself. I'm on a continual journey to reclaim my language. And, um, and so I do not know of a word that is used in Anishinaabe Moan. I do know of two words that would be um, respectful ways of referring to a woman who was at that stage of life. And of course, the obvious one is Gichi Aya'a, is that old, knowledgeable, uh, white haired person, right? That uh, could be male or female. You know, could you could refer to a ninny or you could refer to Quay. Um, so that being said, that was the first, when I read the question, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Although I, I'm not sure that that would be the correct way to say that, you know, because you're 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 referring to them as, um, you know, the uh, most knowledgeable older person, right? The second thing that doesn't really fit for me, but I guess it would be if someone referred to me that way, I would I would accept that, you know, as being that I'm a, a, at that stage in my life. I think um, I had experienced that fairly early in life, um, 16 years ago. And um, and I you know, I haven't had anyone refer to me in that way yet, but um, there's a misnomer for um, the word for our elder women, and it's mindemuye. Mindemuye is uh, always thought to be interpreted as an old woman. But um, I was corrected at one time by my mother, and she said she was a language speaker, so was my father. And she said that means um, that she's carrying, like she's carrying the bundle, you know, of our, maybe our humanity as a woman, or maybe, uh, you know, the bundle, which would be ours as women, right? She's carrying a big bundle. Um, she's carrying, she puts, keeps everything together like that in that way. That's how my mother talked about it. And so that, seems to me like that would be a woman of that age, right? Where you were thinking that if the interpretation loosely is an older woman. Um, but that also was a term of respect and not of a disrespect, you know what I mean? So um, that's, what I, that's what it makes me think of. Um, and when I was proposed the question to do this, I, I thought back to the time that I was experiencing, you know, my um, my grandmother coming lesser and lesser and how I was feeling at the time. And I really, you know, um, I really didn't have a person to, a, a female relative to to talk to about that. And it's, you know, and it's because my, my family, um, I actually went through two sets of parents. Um, my father was murdered when I was 16. My mother um, passed away from heart failure and heart, open heart surgery when she was 71 and I was 27 years old. And in the process of um, being in Anishinaabe and traveling, I, I met you know, an elder from Mille Lacs who said, you know, I want to be your dad. I need a daughter. And I, we immediately adopted each other. 
And that was my father then for several more years. And then um, I met a Kiowa woman named M.A. Ankyu, who was a traditional dancer, a straight dancer. And um, same thing, she said, I need a daughter. Would you be my daughter? And I said, yes, I will. Will you be my mom? She said, yes, I will. And so we had that relationship for several years. And so um, when it came time for me to inquire about those things, I, I really was kind of left to think about it myself and to, um, you know, think about it in the sweat lodge, think about it in the ceremonies that I attended. And, and I would gaze at the grandmothers and um, I understood like I became quieter during that time. I became more watchful. I became diligent. I, I became so many other things that maybe I, in my life I didn't have time for at the time. And then I, as an old, as someone experiencing that, I have to say that I did not experience the um, some of the things that are talked about. Um, I didn't have disruptions in my physical you know, the way that my body was, um, that type of thing. So I, I felt like it was, you know, I felt like it was a blessing. Like I, all of a sudden I'm moving into this area where I can be in ceremony anytime I want. <laughs> and I thought that was really beautiful. And I still feel that way. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that, I know that feeling too. I know the feeling of, of um, having ceremony and then knowing that the ceremony is coming up, looking forward to it, preparing for it, and then going, oh, I guess I'm staying home. <laughs> I guess I'm not going to ceremony, <laughs> you know, and then, and then, you know, not uh, having that anymore, uh, being able to, to just be there in a way and participate fully without worrying about that. And also as a woman sometimes, or as a person, you're sitting there, um, you know, when you're in ceremony and you feel a little something, something happening, you're like, Oh, I better go check because <laughs> when you're going through menopause, like you're sometimes it's unexpected. So like you're, you're sitting in ceremony, you're like, Oh, geez, I hope not. You know, <laughs> you kind of panic and you go to the washroom real quick and you check. I mean, all those things are like reality. But um, I really appreciate what you said about um, going inward, taking the time for yourself um, to be introspective, um, to the way I'm looking at it is gathering strength, like spiritual strength, it feels like to me. Um, I feel like I'm in a very um awakening time another another change another right. another big leap into something uh more more spiritual awareness i suppose more intuition coming through so um keeping on the theme of like lodges i was wondering if um if we could talk about your work uh birthing in the birthing lodge uh and uh and how the, how that's going and it, maybe you could describe for people who haven't who don't know what that's about uh what's happening there what are you doing and why is it so important kind of paint a picture for people okay um sure i'd love to talk about that um <clears throat> so i i go to the um Three Fires Medewan Lodge, and I've been attending there for probably almost 40 years. And I started out as a young person, a young mother. Um, I went to the, when the lodge was first um, renewed in the time that we were in, I was, um, you know, a teenager. That was the first time I fasted when I was 16 years old. And it was when it was when the gatherings were had, held in Mud Lake uh, near near Ladysmith, Wisconsin, and it, we were still in a teepee because we hadn't even built the, the the longhouse type of lodge yet because there wasn't that many people. We could fit in a teepee. And then after about four years, we were like, okay, we have uh, galleries built around the teepee. <laughs> I guess we have to find something else, you know, because there was more people coming and coming. And... Um, in fact, that's where I met Edna when I was, um, I was about 16 years old, I believe, when I met Edna. And um, so 
as we proceeded to grow, um, there were not, at that time, there were not a lot of grandmothers. There were still a lot of young people. You know, uh, Charlie Nelson Ebun was still young and, you know, everybody that was coming from Canada to these ceremonies were still, you know, fairly young. And, um, and so the grandmothers hadn't appeared yet. And so um, they would often ask, you know, like um, our, our chief would ask me to pray for the water. And I was, you know, I was still young. And I would say, okay, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't refuse. It was an honor to be asked. So I would do my best. And then I, and that the, at, right after the water was, you know, given to the people that were sitting in the circle, I would immediately start praying for the grandmothers. <laughs> Please <laughs> send us some grandmothers. And um, and then the grandmothers, you know, I'm sure the other young woman that attended, like uh, Lucy Ducharme uh, was young at that time. And this is before we began to have, you know, children and, and that type of thing. Um, you know, our children are almost born at the same ages. And so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, uh, to look back on that, you know, but um, so there wasn't a lot of um, older grandmother Nokomis, you know, influence at that time. And when the grandmothers did start to come, you know, we had these beautiful times where um, I was just speaking about that today, in fact, in this training. And it was, I was saying, uh, someone was saying, oh, we're going to have the next gathering on the land. And I said, yes, because we can get up at sunrise and I can sing the morning song, <laughs> you know, and it's a song that Edna sings. I think she probably still sings it to this day and just belts it out. And there's a silence with the mist lifting and it's just the most beautiful experience ever. And um, so it was at that time, you know, that I, I started learning and um, <clears throat> experiencing all of these good things. First time I fasted, first time I went in the sweat lodge, first, first of many things that, um, that grew into my spiritual life, you know? <clears throat> so, um, you know, the lodge grew and so did the, um, the attendants of the people. And, you know, at any given time until pre pandemic, um, you know, you'd go to a lodge and there'd be, you know, two, 300 people there. And of course, now um, we are just now starting to resume, um, you know, gathering. And June will be the first time that we will be together. And um, so as I continue to grow and to attend ceremonies, um, I've always been a singer. I was taught to sing. I, I actually was at a power when I was 12. And one of um, the most beautiful singers that I, I can recall in my young life, she would always approach a drum as soon as they started singing. And, um, and I would approach with her and I would just stand there and listen. In my head, I was singing. Inside of myself, I was singing. And then one time we were at a, a, a powwow. Uh, it was in, uh, it was off of Highway 61. Um, Battle Creek Park. And I approached with her and she was singing. And then when she paused, when they started the song again, she looked at me and she said, um, just let it go. Just sing. You know it, right? You're singing in your, in your mind. I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, okay, just let it go. And I did. And I was like, and I sounded just like her. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and then I've been singing ever since, right? So then I started singing in the lodge and, and I started that work. And, and then eventually um, there came a time when uh, I was 18 years old and I met Gudji Cook and she came to the Twin Cities with her husband who was doing an internship at the university. And she started um, talking to women and then she held um, a health meeting at the Red School House where I graduated from in 1977. And she said, Doreen, do you want to be a midwife? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> My arm went up. And so she picked four women. And then she asked us to make a commitment to her for three years. And we all agreed. And she said, you either, you either can't be here in this physical life or someone near you or love that you love is, is going back home. Meaning, you know, someone has passed, right? That's the only way you can miss. 
you have to be dedicated. You're here from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every Wednesday for the next three years. And so the women that she asked, we all agreed. And so there, then it was set. And we began our training in, in the, to be Mundadizikekwe, um, you know. And so that's how I learned. And I'm, I'm forever indebted to her for, for, um, for seeing that I, I, I could do that or I would be a good candidate to do that. Um, go, I had some years and, and probably about 25 years ago in our lodge, um, our, our chief had gone fasting. Now, I don't know how old he was then because he's gone back to the spirit now. He, I, well, he was 91 two years ago when he passed. And um, he came from a seven-day fast. He fasted seven days and seven nights. And, he, and he, when he came to ceremonies, he said, I have a message for the Anishinaabe Kwe. And of course, I'm there sitting in the lodge. And he said, um, I was taken to a place where spirit told me that Undadi Zikewin is going to come back to Anishinaabekwe. And um, Nijo Dewag are going to bring that back in this time. And of course, 25 years ago, I wasn't very busy as a midwife, you know, because no, I had no takers a lot of the time. You know, someone who was interested in having their baby in, at home or in a lodge. And at that time, that lodge wasn't even spoken of yet. <clears throat> so when he made this statement, like it was a, a modern, I, I felt as if it was a modern day prophecy. And I hope in, in the time that I heard that, I hoped that I would see that day, but I didn't know if I would. I said right to myself after he made those statements, I hope I see that day. And that's what I said to myself because I thought it's going to be sometime in the future. Excuse me. About 11 years later, in our Midday Lodge, there were four families that were pregnant, pregnant with twins. Aaron, can you give me something? Yeah. <laughs> And when he when he seen that, he started to talk again about this what he had what he had mentioned in his fast years ago. Collect myself for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Take your time. If you need a break too, we can take a break. It's no rush. Yep. So he began to talk about that. And he, in those two of the families that were there, weren't there in the past. And one of the families was like, oh, I don't know. And then the other family from Michigan, uh, her name was Chris. At the next ceremony, she came up to me and she said, Dorian, I'm pregnant with twins. Do you think I'm the one? And I said, well, I said, you know what? I think you need to go ask um, our leader if you're the one. And she said, well, I have my tobacco already. I was going to give it to you and ask you. And I said, well, let's go sit with him. So we went over into the lodge and we sat by him and and she walked up to him with her same on her hand. And she said, am I? And he said, yes. And she goes, is she? And he said, yes. <laughs> there, was, there was no room for negotiations. 
training. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I said, so she handed me the tobacco and she goes, will you? And I said, yes, <laughs> it's already been answered for me, right? <laughs> Ah, you got, that was mm -hmm. that, that was what I needed. <laughs> um, so then I began to work with her and she, we did, she lived in Michigan. I lived in Minnesota. We had to do prenatals. We had to do them over the phone. When she went to her medical prenatal, she would bring me sats and then we'd go over that. And then we'd talk about other things. And, and that was how it went until um, the next ceremonies we seen each other. And I was able to do a, a actual live prenatal with her. And then it just went from there. And so her twins were born um, July 14th, 2007. When, when our chief had talked about these twins coming and what they would bring, he said at that time, there will be a birth lodge built. And he said, and the birth fire, which had gone, which had almost... Um, disappeared will return. So these Nisho Dewag will be born to the land with a fire as a beacon to bring them here as it was done in the past over 200 years ago. <laughs> so we were like, okay. Um, so we had like a birth team, a couple of her close Medeque friends came to Michigan. Um, her husband learned about how to build that birth fire and how to petition the, you know, Ishkode Manidu. And um, her family was scared. Her father was scared. Her mother was a nurse. She was scared. Her aunt was a nurse. She was scared. And um, we just had to work with that, you know. And so we... We proceeded with plans for the birth and I called our chief and I said, you know, that birth lodge has to be ready. So when should we build it? He said, well, what's your due date? And we figured out, you know, like a week before July 14th. So the lodge was built a week before and the fire could not be lit until eminent labor was there. So they actually called me, I got on a plane and um, I got there and she was already in labor. The birth fire was already lit. Um, so it, that's how it all began. <clears throat> and I know that word of that lodge traveled <clears throat> because I just, um, I just had an encounter with um, a birth worker a few years ago that was trying to build a birth lodge in Minnesota. And she had said, um, well, my, one of my teachers told me about this birth lodge. And I said, well, who was that teacher? And she said, a woman, LCO. And um, so what happened was that family, um, after having the twins, I'll tell you about that birth in a second, but that family moved from uh, Michigan to LCO the next year. So they had another son and a birth lodge in LCO. And I went to that birth and, and um, helped there. So her teacher was a woman that had heard about the birth lodge from LCO, but didn't know the specifics. And um, so she had asked. Um, so my daughter on, on Facebook had asked because she knew the story about the birth lodge and she was wondering how, where, where it had come from, you know, and it turned out that she didn't really know, but she wanted to do that, but she didn't, you know, I guess didn't have the full, you know, meaning and the descriptions and how to do it and everything like that. And so that was kind of a, kind of a challenge for us because I think that people that in, you know, embark upon that have to, um, I mean, they don't have to, but they could, you know, inquire, right? And ask, um, you know, what the perimeters are, what's the protocols, you know, stuff like that. So it turned out that that birth lodge in LCO or in um, Northern Minnesota didn't, didn't work out because, and I feel like it probably 
didn't because there was not there was not the linkage that needed to happen you know um we we're just talking with someone today about a birth lodge that she wants to have her baby in a birth lodge in um, Forest County, Potawatomi in central Wisconsin. So um, it's just so strange how everything all kind of happens at once. You know, like we're talking about it now and we just, you know, we're talking with her in detail today of what she would need to be, you know, what she would need to do. <clears throat> but when I arrived there, um, the twins were, she was already in labor. Chris was already in labor. And we had it beautifully set up the way that the birth lodge was. And um, there was a fire there. The father finally came and sat with the fire and offered his sema. And so then he got all right. And finally the mother came and she was like very fearful. And she told me, she goes, Doreen, I need to talk to you. And I said, do you need a smudge? She goes, yes. I smudged her and I came out of the lodge and I said, what can we do? What can we do to help you? And she said, well, I'm very scared. And I said, well, to go in, you need to let that go. And you, I'm pretty sure your daughter would love you to go in if you can let that go. And so she smudged, she, you know, she was emotional. She went through that. And then she said, okay, I'm ready to go in. So she came into the birth lodge and probably less than a half hour after mom came in, her, you know, grandmother, that was grandmother to the twins, um, Charlie was born and he was the first one born. And then 29 minutes later, Maddie, the, his sister was born. And um, Charlie was, I believe, five pounds, seven ounces. And Maddie was five pounds, eight ounces. So that was, you know, over 10 pounds a baby. And that's a good weight for twins. Um, they were born without any complications. Oh, when I arrived there, I got there at um, 10 p.m. at night. And the sheriff of the reservation met me and two EMTs. And they said, um, just call us if you need help. <laughs> I think they were scared. <laughs> you know, something's going to happen here or whatever. And I said, okay, miigwech, you know, nice to meet you. <laughs> and then I went in to, you know, um, smudge myself and go in right into the birth lodge. And, and actually my daughter-in-law who lives in, on that reserve, on the reservation, <clears throat> she worked at the casino and she got off at 2 a.m., I think. And she came right from the casino. She came into the birth lodge, she smudged and she grabbed a leg. <laughs> and she's, she assisted. <laughs> so... Um, that was her beginnings of her of attending births. And she's attended my, she happens to be there when my daughter gets birth. So I don't know how that happens. You know, it's supposed to be that way. So she's been to three of my daughter's births. And um, so while the birth ceremony is going on, there's three little boy water drums singing midday songs to to the birth to the mom to the baby to the dad to the people there all the people in the community that were her friends came and offered sema to the fire all of her you know male relatives were there with the fire um, her brother was there and her husband now in her birth she held on to both of them for a while before she was ready to push and so she's holding on to to them and she looked at her um, brother and she sees, you know, Wabjeshi as, in, as holding her up. And she looks to her husband and she sees Maingan holding her up. And she's looking at him like, wow, you know? <laughs> and I said, what do you see? And she goes, I seen them in their physical form. Like I seen a Wabjeshi, I seen a wolf, right? I'm like, wow, you know, that's like so powerful. The clan's holding you up in labor, right? And so she was um, just a natural at her giving birth. And she, it was very powerful, very fast for her. And um, so these twins um, in utero, they must have faced each other um, and always held on to each other because after they were born, uh, we took them in and um, 
and that's they went right back to their position of how they must have been in utero. Um, so by nine o'clock the next morning, you know, everybody's warm and cozy and nursing and everything is, life is good, all is well, you know. So, so um, they uh, are well to this day and now they must be, well, can someone do the math? I believe they're 14, right? What year was that? 2007. 2007. 22. Yep, yeah, 14 going on 15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So July, they'll be 15. I just still can't believe that that all took place. Like, uh, you know, it's um, it's a real gift to our Anishinaabe Kwe to have the option of birthing in a birth lodge with the fire, with the community, the family. So I have another story about that's related to that. Um, so there were some young women from the community that were present and they were adolescents. They're very famous dancers in the powwow world. And one of them um, conceived and was, uh, well, now Nojimo Makwa is too. So um, she called me and said, can you come to Peshabi town because I'm gonna have a baby and I wanna have my baby at home. I said, of course. So two years ago in January, I went back to that same reservation where the twins were born and, um, and watched her, her, her beautiful baby boy come into the world. Um, again, my daughter-in-law was present and I said to her, you're going to catch the baby. And she looked at me, she's like, okay. A beautiful birth, no complications. My daughter-in-law, you know, um, was there too. I was holding the perineum. She caught the baby. And so that was her first birth that she helped in that way, you know, fully, like as, as a um, birth worker, right? And midwife. She, so that was a beautiful thing. And, and now he's two as of January it's either seven, second or fourth. I can't, I should know, but I, I'm not good with dates. Um, but he's a beautiful baby and he was named Nojimo Makwa, healing bear. And um, his birth was very beautiful. Um, so my, so this young woman is in med school. She goes for her six week um, you know, postpartum checkup. And her doctor said, um, B, did you tell me you were going to have your baby at home? And she goes, yes, I did. And he goes, well, I don't know that I, I don't know why I don't remember that. But anyway, um, he said, well, what did you do? And she goes, midwife held my perineum. I pushed, had the baby, everything's good. And he was like, well, you are just fabulous. Everything's like, totally back to normal. You look great. He goes, what did you do? She goes, I had a baby, <laughs> but you know, like, because she had a home birth, what does he think she's going to be all tore up or <laughs> I have no idea, but this doctor bought into her health and her birth as being so spectacular that now she's, she's shadowing him as, you know, a med student. <laughs> now, that's not the impressive thing. The impressive thing is that she is going to build a birth lodge after she finishes her education. She's going to build a birth lodge on that reservation where the twins were born. Now, if that's not coming full circle within a short period of time, I don't know what it is. Like it's meant to be, right? And so it's a beautiful story. And I'm so um, blessed that I even, even a like I've even been there. I mean, you know, been a part of that. It's, it's phenomenal that um, she was at the twins birth. I have a picture of her in the lodge with her shaker standing there singing. And there she is saying, I am going to have my baby at home. We couldn't build a birth lodge in January. So she did have baby in her home. And her, the other part of the beauty of that was that her father and mother were there. His mother was there. So great, great grandmother was there and grandmother and grandfather. 
and all of her extended family um, were there to offer their seema, to help cook, to do whatever it was that um, needed to be done. I, I went before Christmas because I didn't want to miss the birth. And uh, so my daughter and her husband drove me to Chicago and her father and mother picked me up in Chicago, <laughs> took me to Peshawi Town, stayed there, um, stayed there till after New Year's, um, you know, and she had her baby. And then I, I came, I stayed there a few more days and then I came home. I was just telling this group that I'm training that um, as indigenous midwife, as traditional midwife, we can't just have a baby and leave. Like, you know, we, we are there to stabilize everything, to be with the family, to be in extra hands, to be, to be, um, you know, giving mom a time to take a bath or, you know, whatever. It's like, you, you don't just up and leave. Like I have an issue with birth centers where you're going to have a baby and then six hours later you're on your way home because you could have just stayed home then you know like what what this what is the service um what is it and so I was talking about that today as well that that's not I don't think it's meant to be that way I think that a helper is a helper and that's how I look at it and, and so you know Gaji taught us you know you are all all the hands and prayers and anything else in between that are needed and you don't just leave you you are there you're a physical presence to uh, make tea to make breakfast to do it at wash some clothes you know whatever and in some cases where we've had women that have maybe had a large tear you know inner tear labia tear whatever they don't want to have they don't want to go to the hospital to get stitched so we're either stitching them ourselves or we're doing, you know, comfrey packs and, you know, that's a 24, you know, maybe more than that. Maybe it's takes more than, it at least takes 24 hours, a steady hot pack to infuse the skin with that medicine. And we've done that, you know, we've done that. Everyone's taking a turn. That's why when we started the, when Gaji set us off on our own said okay go out and do do, do births and we did them all together all four of us were there at first for the first couple of years at least and then after that we did it in twos because you need those extra hands you need um you need all that help you know for midwives in the south that i read about indigenous african or well african midwives they always were by themselves and i was like wow that's some good work, you know, to be able to do it by yourself. Um, and I have been in that position, but I prefer extra hands. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those, um, those, those kids are beautiful kids. And, um, and their brother, Isaac, that was born after them in LCO, um, you know, became a story, you know, as well that, um, he was born in a birth lodge on the shore of Little Round Lake in Elcio in Hayward. Um, so that's the birth lodge. And now, um, are you going to eat? Okay, I'll see you in a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so um, now I have spent some time in Redcliffe, Wisconsin, and um, I met a midwife there through my daughter several years ago. Um, and this midwife is not indigenous, but she has, was invested in the community. Um, and, um, she invited me to do doula training about 15 years ago, and then back to do traditional birth training with the women, um, probably about seven or eight years ago. And now since that time, they have had the first home birth with a birth fire in a birth lodge in a hundred years, they started that. And now they've had 11, 11 home births, you know, seven birth lodges and all with the birth fire. Wow. And I had a lengthy discussion today about women that were concerned saying, how do we tell our male relatives that it's not a funerary fire, it's a birth fire. Because <laughs> our, indig our indigenous men, our Anishinaabe and Nini are saying, no, you can't light a fire because that's only for a funeral. Well, they don't know about the story about how that fire stopped being lit 
when we turned our bodies over to Western medicine and went to the hospital to have birth, we didn't have a fire, right? So 200 years ago, we did, you know? And, and so when our, when our chief said that, you know, Ondadi Zikewin was going to come back to Anishinaabe Quay, and it was going to be with twins in a birth lodge with a birth fire. Nobody questioned that. I didn't question it. I knew that that was right. Because the way I describe it is this. We are a spirit coming to live in this physical life from the spirit world. And so we start coming. When our parents know we're coming, uh, 200 years ago, they lit a birth fire. The birth fire is here. So here's our spirit coming, it comes to this birth fire. We end up taking that breath of life and we live our physical life for however long that is until creator calls us home. Now here on this side, the time that we're called home, our relatives, they light a funerary fire and that fire is the beacon for us to go back to the spirit world. So here's the spirit coming with the beacon to get here to the physical world. We live our life, we live our life until the creator calls us back home. Then that fire is lit and then we go back to the spirit world. It makes perfect sense. It's an acknowledgement of the spirit. Either way, right? So that's how we have to begin to educate our Niniwag to think about it in that way. Because right now there's not a good understanding because mostly the women have been worrying about this birth lodge and this birth fire, right? And now we have to bring our men along and say, do you light the fire for everything, <laughs> right? They hold up that fire for us. That's their part of creation, their balance that they're bringing. We pray for the water and then that comes together and it creates a balance for our life. It creates the support and all of the things necessary to live. We need water, we need fire. So it makes perfect sense that we try to figure out that, to, how to speak about that, even in our own lodges, you know, to speak about um, why that fire is the same. It's not the same fire, but it is the same in the acknowledgement of the spirit, whether coming or whether going. So that's the story of the twins, and I got so emotional. <laughs> I, so it's just, um, so overwhelming yet to this day, you know, to um, to know that already that that reservation that where that began, it's already come around again, you know, and it's um, it's going to be something. So I spent, you know, four years working with the Sturgeon Lake First Nation, and now they have um, embarked upon um, building a, a birth center, a birth lodge, not a birth center like, you know, you have in a city, but a birth lodge that's like their traditional healing lodge. It's a round circular building that actually has four birthing uh, sections to it and a very large open, opening for ceremonies in the center with a place for a fire. And so they will be, they've already had two home births and they will be, once their birth lodge is built, they will be on their way to uh, receiving the women there that wish to utilize that traditional birth lodge. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the other thing that's been happening, which is totally awesome. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so amazing. I have, it makes me think of so many things like, um, like the empowerment and uh, reclaiming these ceremonies, how mm -hmm. that feeds into the whole health of the whole community going forward. And right. And how that's really where our sovereignty is, where our strength is. So it's an act of sovereignty. It's an act of, it, you know, reclaiming our strength and our power for the whole community, not just women, not just uh, one, one part of our community, but for everybody. Um, those teachings are really powerful. I thank you for sharing those stories and giving everyone a beautiful picture of of what was and what is in the future, you know, what can be, why it's so important to birth at home. You spoke about comfrey, um, and I know you, the other medicines and things like that, that you're aware of. Now, sort of, sort of tying that into menopause and this time of our life, or perhaps um, 
medicines or teas or things that would be used in our all throughout our time of whether we're going through moon time or not to strengthen uterus to make things uh, well in that area i'm just wondering if if you're not familiar of medicines or ceremony for menopause per se it's all on a kind of a continuum yes so yes. is there are there medicines and ceremony that you could see that would help us through this um transition into into this uh this new phase of our life mm -hmm. well one of the things that um comes to my mind um immediately when you speak about it being on the continuum or is it you know is it for the beginning stages of life or is it for the you know stages as we get older um one of the medicines that I use a lot in my work um, is uh, Gishi Kandag cedar. Um, and that cedar, for a woman that's pregnant, she's not able to access that during pregnancy until she's in labor, until labor is eminent and she's, or even after labor. And that's that cedar is very powerful um, to balance and cleanse, right? So it's not good for, because it's a, uh, it will start labor. So women can't drink that in pregnancy until they are either on the verge of having the baby or right after, and then it will help them to balance things out. Um, so consequently, you can't have that earlier in your life, but later in life, cedar is a, a wonderful medicine for, um, get you, I, uh, you know, que, because, that um, that medicine is um, what we need sometimes to help um, help us to balance and cleanse, you know, our female um, organs. And the thing that I find that's interesting about that is that um, you know what is what is not good for you know certainly we can't use that during our childbearing years until like I said, after labor, but that we can use it as much as we want in, in the older stages of our life. If it's taken for two weeks on, two weeks off, it, it does really help with a lot of issues that you have around menopause. But not only that, if you're diabetic, it tends to help you to balance your, um, your sugar as well. Um, and so I, I know that to be, I know that's something that I do use a lot, um, not only for sickness, but just for health and well-being for myself. Um, so I use that. The other, the other kinds of medicines that I would suggest uh, for women that are really having struggle, uh, struggle with, you know, some of the uh, symptoms of menopause, and I really don't like to use that word either, but because it's tending to feel like, you know, like w what it says is pause. And like, are men pausing? No. <laughs> Why do they say pause? Are we pausing? No, we're still active. We're still moving. We're still contributing. Like we're, you know, we can even be dynamic at this age. Like what are we paused about, right? It doesn't make sense to me. But during those times where some of those things are, are you know, are evident for women, um, you know, to, for the cohashes to be used, you know, um, of course, not all the time, but um, when when things uh, happen where you're having a lot of um, hot and cold incidents, you know, those types of things, if you're, you're not able to sleep, I know that's a good remedy that um, our people have always used, you know, Anishinaabeg have used that, um, either black or, or blue cohosh. Um, and it does um, ease some of those kind of symptoms, right? Um, but other than that, like I... I for myself personally, I didn't do anything. I drank lots of water and I didn't have any of those symptoms. I don't know why. Even when I was had my cycle, I never even practically would even remember I had, you know what I mean? It's, it didn't get to me like how, how some experience. And I, I guess maybe twice in the time that my, when my Grandmother was leaving and not coming to me twice was the only times that I had something really heavy. And before that, I had, you know, I had a cycle and it was always 
the way it was. But I didn't do anything either to my body, like with, you know, um, medical, you know, birth control, that type of thing. I didn't utilize that at all. Um, and I think that has something to do with it um, for myself. I don't know about others, so because I haven't had enough discussions with, you know, women about that. Um, but for myself, I, I, I continued to stay active. I didn't experience hot and cold flashes. I didn't experience, you know, like heavy, heavy menstrual cramping. I didn't experience those things. Um, so I didn't have to really do too much, you know, um, by way of that. I wanted to ask you about the connection between um, reproductive systems and trauma. Uh, we had somebody raise that yesterday uh, in our session, and it's something that um, I know that you mentioned when we were there visiting with you, and uh, you talked about it, how it can impact birth, uh, birthing. And so I know that more than just birthing, uh, trauma can impact the reproductive system. And so what is your understanding of that? Well, um, my own my experience um, working with, um, cause I only didn't birth, you know, Anishinaabe Kwe women. I, I, I actually birthed, you know, non-native women as well. Um, when I felt we, what we experienced um, as a birth crew was that we saw that there was a, a correlation with um, being stopped at, um, you know, dilation three or four, where you don't just don't proceed. And, um, and so what we started doing is we started in our prenatal, in our indigenous prenatal model, we would, we would do um, training on relaxation to touch. We had um, families be involved in that. We, we worked with them on their breathing. We worked with them on offering their tobacco. We worked with them on these various things. And, um, we also um, interviewed them and discussed like their their relationships, their births and what they were like, and we documented all of that, right? And so it came down to finding, to us realizing that women that were getting, not pro progressing, often had a sexual trauma. And so, we started, um, once we knew that, we started asking ahead of time and asking if we, if you, if we can help you with this birth, we want to make sure that it goes to fruition. <clears throat> so we would ask them, you know, these are the questions we need to ask. And if you're comfortable answering them, then we can proceed. <clears throat> so we would ask them very forthright were you molested were you raped did you did you did something happen to you in way of a sexual trauma that you can share with us because if that's the case we need to work with you on some healing for that in order for you to not you know experience um the difficulty of that in labor because it will show its head in labor right it definitely will and so the women that wish to go down that road of healing, then we were able to work with them, right? The ones that didn't want to go there, we said, it's going to happen. And, I, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we can't help you all the way through your whole birthing process, you know? And so there was just a few, right? But most of them wanted to actually let that go as well, not even knowing that maybe it was there down there someplace, you know? So then we started asking those questions and we started doing that healing work. And once we were able to do that, then um, we realized that it was a lot of people, a lot of women, probably 10 out of 10, which um, even is evident today. Like I did a doula training and I had 15 women participating. And I asked, on the fourth day, I asked all of them, 
have any of you experienced um, sexual trauma, molestation, fondling, you know, rape, um, forced anything? And all the hands went up, all the hands. And um, that was just a few years ago. So it's not, so we need to continue to push forward toward healing our women before they give birth. That's what I know to be true. Um, I would like to ask just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, some of these questions actually come from the Q&A from people okay. listening in. So okay. um, two of them are around the birth lodge and two of them are around the medicines that you mentioned. So we'll start with the medicines one. So you okay. mentioned cedar. Can yep. you expand a little bit more on that? Like, how do you use it? Do you make a tea? Do you drink it? Is there anything in oh, okay. how you prepare it? Okay, so it's kind of all of the above. <laughs> um, so cedar can be used in various ways. And cedar, it, you know, we considered that nokomis mitig, right? That's our grandmother tree. And um, so that's our kin, that's our relative. And so when we when we take her for medicine, we take, we can ingest her. We can ingest in terms of making a tea. There's a golden rule about cedar. If you're going to use tea for a cedar bath, then you can boil cedar because it creates all of the oils that come up to the surface. But if you're going to ingest it, you simmer it, not more than 10 minutes because then it's too strong and you can't ingest it then after that. So if you're going to use it to do a cedar wash, wiping people down, then yes, boiling is okay. But if you're going to also have it as a tea, then you have to make that separately because that can only be, you know, less than a caramel color, right? It can't be um, really dark brown. A dark brown would be when we're doing cedar healing and that's going to be used to wash an, the entire body, right? Um, you can also have it ingest it in a powder form. So you would grind the cedar up and you just take a little pinch and, and that is enough to ingest it, to take it internally for cleansing and healing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. And then we also do the cedar healing where the, um, the area that that person is going to be on, whether standing or laying down is on a bed of cedar. And this is something that, um, that our, our Anishinaabe Kwe, um, Mide Kwe have been doing for many years. And it's, it's always um, laid flat, you know, with the dark side up. Very directly, the person lays on that. Um, so of course, with all those things, there's other, you know, with all those healings, there's other components of that. Um, but that's the basis of the cedar. And so for a woman to drink it, um, either, like I said, eminent labor, meaning she's past four, she's like maybe eight or nine, you know, ready to push maybe, and, and she can she can get that. She can actually get a burst of energy from that, and she can have it after she's delivered her placenta, and that um, is going to also help her internally, you know, with her, um, with healing. But um, yeah, so it can be used in many ways. It can be used in a, um, in a smudge, um, actually with sage burning and then putting powdered cedar on top as well. Um, it's used during a full moon when we, when we offer our tobacco ties and then the cedar is put in after every tie to renew that fire for each, each woman and her prayers. So yeah, in many, many ways, if that's adequate answer. Yep, that's a great answer. Thank you. Okay. So my second follow-up question is about the birth lodge itself. So where I'm from in Northern Alberta, I can't even think of ever hearing about birth lodges or how did we do birthing in the mm -hmm. old days, but I know some of my recent ancestors were midwives, mm -hmm. but the stories around that and the teachings around that, I haven't been able to get so when, I, when you're saying a birth lodge, 
what I'm envisioning is something like a sweat lodge. And I don't know, can you describe how a birth lodge? Looks? Yeah, it's round. It's, it's a round lodge with one door, an Eastern facing door in and out. And it's, it's tall enough. You know, a sweat lodge is too short. You can't move around. A, a mom can't like how we had it set up. Um, we had a, um, we had a, a piece of, of wood that went across um, part of the circle and we wrapped towels around it and then she could lean on it and she could, you know, let her body weight rest while she'd be in between contractions. And um, the, the birth lodge is tall. Like you have to be able, to, it's got to be tall enough for you to walk around, right? And, um, and I think probably in the past, it was probably barked, but now we, you know, tarp it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, there's very specific, you know, dimensions for it. Um, and yeah, so it's, it is like, um, it, it, it doesn't look like a tall sweat because it's too big. It's much bigger than a, the circumference of a sweat. Yeah. I have a picture someplace, but you know, on my computer, like where I'm at, I, I, I my computer is not cooperating with me today. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's helpful to be able to know that it's that, like, yeah. yeah, that it's not, it's not like people are crawling in. And <laughs> so, so yeah, tired. you gotta be able to walk in and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting your skirt caught as you're crawling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. really interesting, actually. I, I, Well, I hope one day to be present as a helper in one of those lodges. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah. So um, I guess the, the this will be our last question. And it's just uh, thinking about this time in our lives, which is going into uh a, a different phase in our life it's uh, mm -hmm. entering into this beautiful elderly phase and uh, what is the connection that you see between the work that you're doing uh, the empowerment and people who are entering into or already through menopause what is that do you see a connection with that um a connection with like mid midwifery and oh, yeah and the, I have the to tell you, you know, I'm glad that you asked me that because I have to tell you a story about um, one of our greatest. Um, I was actually very happy to meet him as a as a teenager, and I I met this beautiful midday man who um, was actually an eighth degree midday man, and his name was Archie Mose Ibun, and he was from um, Balsam Lake, Wisconsin. And I met him when I was like 15 years old and he shook my hand and he touched me and he said, your parents were Medewin. Your grandparents were Medewin. You're going to be Medewin one day too, he said. And then I fast forward nine years or let's see, even six years. And he was at our lodge in Bad River, Wisconsin. And, um, our chief had asked me to talk about um, the midwifery, you know, midwifery to the lodge. And I, and I talked to the lodge and then it was silent, you know, and I, I talked about midwifery. I talked about learning and about births and I, I was just all excited. And then it was quiet. And so he said, well, okay, we're going to have a break. And so everybody left the lodge and um, Archie Ibun went to sit in a lawn chair um, by a little tree. So I grabbed my sema and I go up to him and I said, um, uncle, can I talk to you? He said, sure. So I sat on the ground there by his, his uh, lawn chair and I gave him my sema and he took it and I said, what am I supposed to do? I said, what am I going to do? I got no takers. And he laughed, you know, and he said, well, my girl, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, they're not ready. He said, you know, um, uh, for whatever reason, they're not ready yet. But he goes, but I see you as an older woman and 
I want you to do this. He said, I want you to keep your knowledge, revisit it every year, read your books, do whatever you got to do to keep that. He said, because when you're older, you're really busy. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll take that, you know, and I said, miigwech, and, and I shook his hand, and I always remembered that, what he had said to me, because he he knew my family was Medeo just by touching me, so he knew what the heck he was saying, <laughs> so I, you know, I felt like, okay, I can, I can do that, I can get busy with life, and I can wait, and I did, you know, and then about I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, I got really busy and I've been busy ever since. And I, I, I love this work. I love, I love watching life come into the world. Um, and that's basically, you know, on dad is EK when that's, that means birth. Right. But it also means like the art, the art, the act of giving birth. And, and so, um, that is, that is a powerful thing. Um, it's powerful because, um, just to witness that is powerful. And it takes you to a place. Like when my daughter had her baby in the birth pool at my house, um, she's Vivia's seven now. Her name is Z-Beans. Um, she and her mother um, looked at each other and time stopped. And I was, I was the other equation. I was like the little angle, you know, her mother, daughter, me, grandmother. And I, and time stopped and we all, like she continued to look at her mother, but I continued to look bo at both of them. <laughs> and they were just like, you know, time literally stopped. And that's like so beautiful. Um, I just want to mention like, uh, you know, I, I, I work for White Earth Nation right now. And uh, I'm, I'm just, starting to be able to do some birth work there but last may we um we delivered uh well I, we didn't i'm i mean we were present at a birth and um this young woman is lakota but lives um you know and works for white earth and she's a beautiful you know lakota young woman and you know she had her 10 pound baby in a birth pool um at home and um, my daughter actually caught um, her baby girl. Um, my daughter Alana is now an apprentice midwife and also learning the ways she's been to like with me about nine births so far. And so she was involved in that. But um, so when we had, so now it starts there. And it, to me, you know, it sounds, sounds kind of cliche, but it's one birth at a time, <laughs> you know, one birth at a time. Here we go. And, uh, and I, and I, I do, I wish that we were busier, but we're already looking at a birth now in Wisconsin and Forest County, Potawatomi. So that's good news. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it's really a blessing to do that work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's more questions in the in the thing, but um, it's it's already uh, eight thirty Eastern time, and I know where, where a, did the time go? No, <laughs> I know you've had a really busy day. You're with a with your group there, and oh, uh, they've and, gone to dinner. They're fine. <laughs> yeah. I'll go catch up with them. Yeah, yeah. So we appreciate you uh, so much for the work that you do for sh taking the time to share with us today. Um, we know that that you're a busy person. We just have so much respect for you, and we're really, really grateful for you and and the work. I'm so doing. grateful for you guys too. I um I proudly wear my my shirt today, and um, now I have like you know these this group of young women here. They want to you know make shirts the next time I gather with them, so that's a good thing. Um, but I do I you know I'm I am serious about bringing um. I, right now at this at this time in my life um i'm i'm still my commitment is still there to bring young women along you know and i um i do really want to make that happen and so i hope that they keep coming and asking 
And um, if Taryn, if you're watching, I love you and I still am committed to you, even though we haven't seen each other since the pandemic. <laughs> now you can come to White Earth. <laughs> um, but I will be doing some birth work there. And um, I do still want to have them come there and gather. Hopefully that will, will spur something, you know, again, so that we can get back on track with long distance learning is not for these young women. I don't know why it just didn't work out that way, but now that we can actually meet again, it's, it's going to be, hopefully it's going to be, you know, kick in here. So, mm -hmm. but I really appreciate the time and, and I don't know how many people are on there. Um, I, it, sees, it looks like there's a lot of participants and there's some more questions, but, um, but I, it's been a pleasure and I'm honored to, uh, to sit with you tonight and, um, Really honored to even, you know, be able, I mean, I, I had my tears and, you know, all of that is, all of that is good because that's how, that's how important and um, powerful, you know, um, these things are like to have a, I'm still amazed that to have someone say this is going to happen and then it happens, you know, wow, you know. And I know that our, our chief is um, up there probably being able to do more than he, 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 he could if he was still here, you know. So I, I know that he's in a beautiful place. And it's still hard to know that we will gather ceremonies and it'll be a different, it'll be way different, you know. So we're, that's what we're dealing with, too. Um, but I hope to see you someday and hope to sit with you again and, and sing and do whatever we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> All so right, Wayne, everybody, Chimi Gwetch, for having me. Thank you so much, Tareen. Yeah. Okay, right. last words, uh, Tanya. Um, I guess just the last word. So there were a number of questions that people put in the Q&A that unfortunately we couldn't get to. Uh, but I would encourage you to go out to start finding those answers in your community as much as you're able to, because this kind of community work and these conversations are important to starting to learn about and reclaim whatever ways that we had around this lifetime transition and also creating maybe new ones. So take your questions out, um, go and ask and if possible, share the answer so it helps us all out along the way and um, again I just want to thank you Doreen so much for the beautiful sharing you know it could just really feel the power of the story that you shared and um, I, I did some Indigenous um, full spectrum doula training so it's something that's also I, I really enjoyed hearing about the birth lodge as well so thank you again for that and, and thank you, everyone, um, for tuning in with us this evening. And um, I, I hope you have a good long weekend. Miigwech. Hi, hi. Yep, hi, Winnie.